But for now, uh, we're going to be finishing or starting the next chapter of the book of Hebrews, okay? chapter 3. Um, one of the guys, uh, one of my friends told me that uh, I'm going uh, too quickly through the book of Hebrews. So maybe you guys can tell me if that's true or not. <laughs> we'll be starting chapter 3 today. Uh, and if you guys will go ahead and stand with me in honor of reading of God's word. Um, this is Hebrews chapter 3. We'll just take a look at the first six verses, so 1 through 6. I'll read it, declare it to be God's word. We'll thank him for it together uh, as a church family, as is our habit. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who is faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we, I just want to say thank you uh, for the Agagenian life. We want to say thank you for your word. Uh, we want to say thank you for Jesus, uh, who is uh, Lord over all things. Jesus, I pray that as we uh, really unpack these verses and, and take a look at you in them, I pray that you would uh, really help us to see the beauty, as we talked about in Psalm 27 this morning, the beauty of you, uh, Lord, the beauty of you uh, among us by your Holy Spirit uh, right now in your temple, the church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. When I was thinking about kind of what the, uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews is doing, you're, you're kind of basically saying, you know how great Moses is? Well, Jesus is so much better than that. He's so much better than that. Um, last summer, uh, we, we were able to go uh, on a little vacation uh, to uh, Arizona because they hadn't yet closed down for COVID. Uh, and so we were able to actually take our kids to a water park kind of a thing. It was really fun. They hadn't really been to like a real water park. They'd been to swimming pools and, of course, our grandparents' swimming pool. And they love it. They love swimming. And so I was trying to convey to them just how much better this water park is going to be than your grandparents' swimming pool. Though that is great. It's a lot of fun. You've learned how to swim there. This water park is like so much better. you know. And that's kind of what the writer here is doing, is, is really drawing attention to, to the glory that Moses does have. I mean, he, he doesn't, it's not like he's nothing. Uh, because in the Jews' eyes, he was greater than even the angels. I mean, the angels were the mediators of the law, but Moses was the one who received the law. And he, he led them as the first apostle and high priest of the Israelites. So he had glory and honor. But Jesus has even more, and we'll kind of take a look at that. And the kind of the two points as we unpack these six verses is Jesus as a glorious apostle and how he's also a faithful son. He's a glorious apostle, and he's a faithful son. Now, the writer starts, uh, you know, we had just finished chapter 2, and chapter 2 finishes uh, with the writer focusing on how Jesus is the one who suffered all that we have done, all that we suffer, all that we're tempted in. Jesus himself has also suffered this. He did it without sin, and therefore he's able to help us in our own temptations, in our own trials, in our own sufferings. He's able to perfectly help us. And, of course, we can finish with that kind of getting down on ourselves, right, that we're, we're these sinners, you know, that we, we are tempted to sin, we do sin. It's so much easier to give in to temptation than to resist it. And we can become somewhat maybe... Uh, discouraged by our failings and our weakness. And so it is not uh, without purpose that the very first thing that the writer does now is say, therefore, in light of the fact that Jesus helps us in our temptation, in light of the fact that he has defeated death, in light of the fact that he has set us free from the penalty and power of sin, therefore, holy brothers. And that phrase simply means brothers and sisters. It's men and women here, both. Holy brothers. Now, the word holy it has two meanings in the Bible. Uh, it means both sanctified, meaning purified, uh, as well as set apart, kind of the idea of uh, divine purpose. You're set apart for a divine purpose, but also you've been set apart for a divine possession of God. Now, the inner reality of God's elect, his people, remember the children of Abraham that we talk, spoke about last week, uh, is that they're seen as perfect before the Father. Before the Holy Judge, we are declared righteous and perfect Forever. That's, that's our standing. That's how God sees us because of Jesus. His death and his resurrection on our behalf. His life has been given, imputed to us. This is what the Father sees. The inner reality, however, means that we are called to live differently than we do now. Right? It's kind of becoming who we are. If this is true of who I am, I need to really be living this out in my daily life. 
Uh, and this has really to touch on the idea of identity. I mean, we know how incredibly important identity is to our lives. How I view myself, right, my view of myself, really begins to shape how I live, how I act. If I, if I view myself as this despised and wretched worm that so many of us reform guys like to talk about, right, uh, then I'm going to begin to act that way. Or I'll pendulum swing the other way to try not to be those things, but the motivation is still there. It's not gone away of to really dealing with this false sense of identity. Because as God says, you are holy. You're brothers and sisters. The Father has sent the Son, as we see here, in order to set you free. You have eternal and infinite value before God. You are beloved of God. This needs to become my view of myself, your view of yourself. And if we really begin to see ourselves as God sees us, that yes, we are broken, yet we're still beautiful. We have fallen, yet we've been raised up in Christ. We are fearful, yet we have courage in the spirit. We've been lost, but now we're found. If that really is my view of myself, consider how you would live differently. How would you really live differently, especially in your relationships with others? How would you be treating others if that was really your view of yourself? The next aspect that the writer uh, focuses on from the holy brothers, holy brothers and sisters that were together in this holy family, is that we have a heavenly calling, right? And there's both a calling from heaven to us as well as a calling to heaven. Now, the word calling there, it has a, at its base word the, the term kaleo, which means to be called out of something into something else. And really, the writer is reminding the church again that God is the one who's called us into his kingdom. His is the voice that we listen to and follow. And we'll take a look at that uh, in a couple of weeks. We'll get into God's voice. This reminds me of Colossians chapter 1, where Paul says that we're to be giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We've been transferred from one kingdom. Now our citizenship is totally anchored, never to be removed ever in this other eternal heavenly kingdom. And it's the voice of Jesus Christ that draws us and calls us. It's his voice. That's why I said in John chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So it's heavenly in the sense that Jesus has called us from heaven to be his holy divine possession and people. But it's also heavenly in the sense that Christ has come down to us and inaugurated his kingdom here and now, and we're working out the reality of this kingdom now until its consummated end with his second coming. So in this sense, also as this special family, we're called to live out the values of the kingdom that is us. It's our values. The kingdom values are to be our values. It's also heavenly in the sense that our ultimate forever home is being the new heavens and the new earth with our immortal eternal resurrected bodies and a glorified earth. And this is the eternal hope that we have secured for us in the death, the resurrection, and ascension of Christ. This is why we as the heavenly and holy brothers and sisters are best approximating that here and now until Christ comes. This is kind of the goal of the church. Now this is what Jesus has done for us and how he has served us, but the focus moves very quickly from there onto Jesus himself. It says, consider Jesus. Have your minds fixed, your gaze set upon Jesus. Remember, at the beginning of chapter 2, we had these warnings not to drift away or neglect the faith or not to neglect the church. How are we to do that? Have our gaze fixed on Christ, to consider Christ. That's what the word consider means. And there are these two titles that are given, the apostle and high priest of our a confession. Now, those words are given on purpose by the writer because uh, Moses was seen and understood as the first apostle and first high priest of national Israel. And so for the writer to say, this apostle and high priest role that you're very aware of, this is actually Jesus fulfilling that role in its ultimate end. See, Moses was sent by God to rescue Israel out of Egypt and to bring them under the old covenant. He was to faithfully speak the word of God to the people and to build the tabernacle for worship. Moses was supernaturally preserved for the task. I mean, we took a look at uh, Exodus at length in 2020. And, you know, we saw how he was preserved supernaturally for this task. He was called by God in very supernatural ways. He was, in many ways, the supreme example of a prophet. A prophet is one who speaks God's word to the people. 
but a priest is one who represents the people to God. And Moses is kind of this prototype of the Messiah figure because he did both. He brought God's word to the people. He also, especially we know uh, how things ended in Exodus, he represented the people to God when God wanted to destroy them because of their faithlessness, right? The rejection of God. Moses actually stood in the gap and interceded on their behalf. But this is a prototype of Jesus. He was speaking about this to the Israelites. And we know that Moses had a very particular role that was unique. No, no other prophet had a role like Moses did. No other apostle of Israel had a role like Moses did. We have this description, number 17. Uh, the Lord is speaking about these other prophets and these other leaders that he would have uh, eventually raised up and speaking about how he would talk to them kind of in these, these dreams and these visions and these riddles. But this is what he has to say about Moses. He says, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly and not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. But Moses knew that his particular role was to point to something greater than him. He knew that. This is why Jesus says in John 5, If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? He knew he was pointing to something greater than himself, namely the Redeemer of God's people. See, Jesus has, is more honorable uh, apostle and high priest of God's covenant people seen in the pan-national church. And he was appointed just as Moses was appointed. So who appointed Jesus? And we talked about his divinity in chapter 1, that he is very God of very God. So who appoints Jesus? I mean, who, who appoints God to do this, right? Well, again, uh, the, the gospel of John. Jesus said to them, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so even I am sending you. And here we get into kind of these roles of the Trinity, right? The Trinitarian roles of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and the Father was the one who from eternity past appointed Jesus, the Son, to be the Savior of his people. He was sent by the Father to redeem and rescue his children. He went out of his love for the Father, right? Jesus obeyed his Father. He loved his Father. He went out of love for his Father. But Jesus also went out of this uh, supreme love for us. This Going and being sent by the Father uh, was a loving and a willing obedience, even though he knew that the cost would be his life. The faithfulness of Jesus is that he lovingly and obediently went through with their plan. It's faithfulness of Jesus. He didn't waver, he didn't fail, but he was successful through and through. Now, why the focus, why, why, why you begin to speak about Jesus being the, the focus of a confession? It's kind of an interesting word that's thrown out there, right, uh, in this little book. We don't often talk about this uh, very often, this idea of confessions. I mean, think about confessing sin, you know, but this is, a, this is not what this is talking about, right? He's the, the high priest of our confession. Obviously, it was the gospel that was kind of codified in an oral thing. Well, creeds and confessions uh, are extremely important for distinguishing what the church believes, absolutely, unbelievably important for really distinguishing and establishing what the church believes and teaches. This is why at our own member meetings, we kind of go through one of the older creeds uh, that has been established a uh, long time ago, the Nicene Creed, and it really establishes what we believe at a very foundational level. Of what, it, what, it, what does it take to be a Christian, right? What does it actually mean to be a Christian? What's the, es the essence of the gospel? Well, uh, Paul does this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, he actually gives us a very, very, very small kind of proto-confession uh, to the church. And this is the essence of the gospel as he's giving it to the church. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Okay, this confession. That Christ died for sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. We'll let the fire truck pass for a second. The joys of outdoor church. <laughs> uh, speaking of outdoor church, we're, we'll be uh, moving back inside uh, an Easter. Yay. Woo. Uh, yeah, we'll be starting at 11 a.m. though, just because we want to have some more time for the transition. And also we won't have lunch uh, afterwards on Easter because it's, it's our anniversary, right? We've got to do something special as a church. We already went through our angsty teenager phase. All right. 
Uh, let me give you another example of a confession that was uh, established before the end of the first century. We think of these like developing kind of slowly over time, but they weren't. I mean, these things were established right away within the generation of the apostles. They're establishing these confessions that were necessary to hold to and to believe to be considered a Christian, to be part of the church. This is from the Apostles' Creed, nearish the end of the first century. They would say, I believe in God the Father Almighty and in Christ Jesus, his only Son, our Lord, who was born from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, who under Pontius Pilate was crucified and buried, on the third day rose again from the dead, ascended to heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, whence he will come to judge the living and the dead, and in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the remission of sins, the resurrection of the flesh, and the life everlasting. So this is just kind of the foundational level of what it is to be a Christian, the things that we affirm and believe and hold to to be a part of the church. And the church throughout the last 2,000 years have kind of codified different creeds and confessions, again, to kind of help, you know, establish these doctrinal understanding of faith and practice. I already mentioned one, the Nicene Creed that came out of the Council of Nicaea in 325. Uh, and really, that, that one's actually really important in the history of the church. I'm a history, like a church history guy. I love church history. Hopefully you guys are learning something about church history with me. It's really important to know our background, right? But it, this was actually a really important confession uh, because it actually unified the church in a way that had not yet happened throughout the Roman Empire. I mean, the church had been scattered, persecuted in different places, oppressed in other places, but in terms of the first time in the history of the church, a, a, an actual confession or a creed that was unanimously accepted throughout the empire. It's really, really, really important for unity. Later on, you know, during the Reformation, uh, we have kind of this burgeoning new confessions and creeds uh, because, you know, they really needed to distinguish what they as these Protestants believed and held to and taught because there's a lot of misinformation. We think of like, you know, fake news is like a new thing. Not really. <laughs> the reformers had to deal with fake news about themselves all the time. So they put together these confessions, put together these different creeds to help really establish what they believe. Uh, the Augsburg Confession was probably the first one that came out uh, to really establish what Lutheranism is. And uh, Philip Melanchthon uh, is Luther's really good friend and fellow reformer, put it together. It's a beautiful confession. It's really long. Uh, it's kind of boring, but it's really beautiful at the same time. So, you know, definitely encourage you to read it if you want to go to sleep. Uh, and then, of course, later, like 70 years later, they came out with what's called the three forms of unity, which uh, this is what we as a church subscribe to. It's the Belgic Confession, Heidelberg Catechism, and the Canons of Dort. Now, those are funny names, funny terms. Feel free to look them up. I was going to have them on the website. Actually, I forgot to give them to you to put on the website. That's okay. Uh, but we as a church subscribe to the, the three forms of unity and the Westminster Catechism. All of that I mentioned simply because confessions are really important. Creeds are really important for really understanding scriptural truth and how we uh, live our faith and practice. But ultimately, the point the writer is trying to make is that Jesus is the ultimate head and end of any confession at all. It's all about knowing Jesus. It's all about loving Jesus. It's all about falling in love and relationship with him. That's the whole point of these things at all. It's not to just run around saying, I know these things. Uh, it's, the point is relationship, right? That Jesus, to know him as the apostle and high priest of your confession. And, you know, sometimes it's just fun to do, to do catechism. My kids actually really like catechism. They're catechizing their friends now, <laughs> which is kind of funny. But he's a, the apostle, the glorious apostle. But he's also a faithful son. And there's this juxtaposition that the writer has in Hebrews 3, right, of Moses is this faithful servant of God. Now, he's also kind of like been given the blueprint for building uh, God's people. Uh, he's the guy, guy that kind of got things started. But who's the one that gets the glory? Is it the one who receives the blueprint for the building, or is it the architect, right? It's the architect, right, Kevin? He gets the glory, you know? Always gets the, Kevin gets the glory. No, I was kidding. Uh, <laughs> But the architect always gets the glory for these buildings. You know, I went to school at ASU, and we have a couple of buildings that were built, or architect, whatever, uh, by Frank Lloyd Wright. And if you know, you, some of you might know that name. It's a very famous name in the architecture world. Uh, but we never say, like, oh, that construction company gets the glory for building that beautiful building on campus. No, Frank Lloyd Wright always got the honor for that, that, that beautiful building that's on the campus. And this is kind of the idea that the writer is saying here is that Moses is great, yeah, but he's kind of like the head contractor of the construction crew that's building this. You know, it's the architect, God himself, in the person of his son, who gets the glory for this building. Now, why does God speak of his people using the term house uh, or household? 
Well, I mean, this is consistent throughout the entirety of the Bible, from very beginning all the way until the end, right? It's a, it's a deeply rooted, from the very beginning, origin of humanity. God desires to have families and to have homes and homes and ho- households and families that glorify him and enjoy him. I mean, God chose a family to bear the Savior of the world. I mean, this is extremely important. Families are hugely important to God. He speaks of his people as his dwelling place, his home. Exodus 29, I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. He's desired to be with his people as his house. And the goal of the Christian faith journey is to learn to abide in Christ. Right? Abiding is kind of this household language. of Resting, of reclining, to be at ease. John chapter 15, Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. That's the goal of the Christian faith journey, is to learn to abide. And that's really hard for many of us to do. I know for myself, per- I'm just speaking for myself, personally, I'm, when I'm at home, I'm sort of like always doing stuff. Like this, I'm always cleaning something up or picking something up or cooking or doing the dishes or whatever it is. I'm always doing something. In fact, when my kids play family, no one wants to be the papa because it's too much work. <laughs> I just I have a hard time giving myself permission to really rest and to enjoy the moment sometimes. And it's not something to glory in, right? That's, I'm not saying that to like glory in. I'm saying that it's something I need to learn how to do is to rest in the Lord and to give myself that, that space to do. This is the goal of the Christian life. It's this household abiding language. Jesus is greater than Moses in that he was faithful as a son. See, Moses was faithful as a servant, but Jesus is faithful as the son. And the writer, again, is kind of making, he quotes that kind of very famous proverb of the day that the builder of building is greater than the building itself. We already kind of talked about that. Um, And that's a really important lesson for us to remember that there is not a hard line distinction between Old Testament Israel and New Testament church. Okay, there's not a hard line here. Really, Old Testament Israel is, in many ways, a, kind of the setting the stage for the New Testament church, which is the truest expression of what God started in the Old Testament. And we'll take a look a lot more about that uh, in the next section of, of Hebrews chapter 3. But Moses served God's house for a particular function, which is to foreshadow in his person, in his uh, ministry, the law, and what the Messiah would be and do for his people. See, Jesus was faithful in his incarnation, being sent by the Father to become human. He was faithful in his submission to the Father, obedience uh, to the Father in ways that we all fail. He was faithful in being tempted without sin and going through trials and sufferings perfectly, trusting the Father, whereas we often kick against that. He was faithful in his substitution to die on our behalf. He was faithful in his resurrection to give us new life. So who gets to be a part of this this new household, right, this household of God? Ephesians chapter 2. Paul says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but your fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. All who come to Jesus Christ get to be a part of his house, get to be part of his family, his household, and he's building this. And you're called saints. That's pretty awesome. Like, I don't have to have the Roman church sanctify me. I'm already a saint, you know? I get to be enrolled in the book of life. What did God's house look like in the Old Testament? Well, obviously, again, we talked about the goal was to be with his people, but because of sin, there had to be a separation uh, between God and man. And so there was the tabernacle. Later, there was the temple. Now, the building of the temple is kind of an interesting story. I'll just summarize here is uh, David was given kind of like the blueprints for this, but wasn't allowed to build it. He had sinned too much. He'd done too many bad things. And so his son Solomon would actually get the glory of building the temple. The process took a long time, partly because they had to shape every single stone off-site. There was not not sing- allowed to have a single sound of uh, instruments or of equipment or anything on the building site. They would come, they'd bring it in, and they'd set the stone exactly where it was supposed to go. Quiet, reverent, and silent. So why it took so long time? And I love that picture. I feel like that's us, right? We're being uh, mined and we're being shaped in the quarry of our life now until it's time for Jesus to bring us home and to fit us exactly where we belong. It's kind of a, a beautiful image of that. The New Testament has the same language of the temple of the living God and gets reoriented around now the New Testament church. Jesus is building his church one person at a time. 
Now, what's re- what is kind of the requirement for being uh, a part of this house? Well, it takes endurance, perseverance, holding fast to our confession, to the boasting of the hope that we have in Christ. We have, uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll have Hebrews chapter 3, uh, 14, for we've come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Matthew 10, Jesus says, and you'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Or Hebrews 6, and we desire each of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. So the question that can kind of arise as we have these uh, calls for endurance and perseverance is, does it mean that I can actually lose my salvation? Right? That's kind of a question that can kind of come into our minds. Well, the answer, short, is no, <laughs> you can't. Jesus clearly teaches that any who come to him in faith at all have already been elected by the Father to do it. He's the one, the Father is the one, who ultimately draws us to Christ. He gives us his spirit, gives us, brings us a conviction of our sin and a desire to be saved at all. He gives us faith to grasp on to the death and resurrection of Christ on our behalf. Jesus reaches out his hand to hold on to us. He draws us up out of the waters of sin and death and sets our feet on the solid ground of his life. The Father, whose hand had been drawing us to Christ, now holds us so nothing will ever take us away from him again. And like a loving and strong Father, he holds our hand through all of the twists and turns of life, ensuring that we will endure to the end when we'll see him face to face in glory and in life. Uh, F.F. Bruce, the great Bible commentator, says, Continuance in the Christian life is a test of reality. The doctrine of the final perseverance of the saints has as its corollary and salutary teaching that the saints are the people who persevere to the end. We all know uh, people who have stopped running the race, right? Who have, have wandered away from the faith, who have drifted away or neglected or fell away from the living God. We all know and have stories about that. I myself have family members who have, who have done that, and it's a really sad thing to see. Jesus talks about uh, one of my favorite pa- parables is Mark chapter 4, uh, the parable of the four soils. The gospel is the seed that's scattered everywhere. And there's different soils that can receive God's word. And we'll, I'll speak more uh, at length about this in a couple of weeks. Uh, but really, there's, there's three uh, soils that end up not making it. There's only one good soil that actually ends up bearing fruit. But there's three that don't. The first is the road. And this is a hard heart. And it's, a sin, it's a heart that's been hardened to the gospel and to God's word because of sin. The second is kind of this shallow root system that grows up really fast, but then it withers really quickly. This is having a shallow foundation in our faith. Poor teaching, poor discipleship, poor community. Uh, these kind of lead to a very shallow root system where we might have some kind of joy in the Lord and feel this spiritual experience, but then, man, when the things of life get hard, I'm, it's, it's gone, right? Because there's not solid teaching. There's not solid community around you. The third is it grows up, but it grows up among bushes with thorns, and any fruit, any plant at all gets choked out and killed. This is a smothered faith, and, and Jesus identifies this as two different things begin to smother our faith if we're not careful, as the worries and the cares of the world can begin to really smother our faith, but also there is a love for the world and a desire for riches that can also choke out our faith. We want to avoid both of these. So what does it take to persevere to the end? What has God given us to run this race with endurance, to hold fast to our boasting and our confidence to the end? Let's go back to verse 1, kind of circling all the way back to the beginning. One, it takes a renewed identity. We talked about identity, seeing ourselves as saints, beloved of God, a treasured possession of his, letting his identity of me be the lens by which I view myself. The second is it takes a covenant community. Right? It's not just me and Jesus. We're holy brothers and sisters, plural. It takes a covenant community to do this, running together with others who committed through all seasons of life. Third, it takes a surrendered humility. They're to submit to our apostle, to our great high priest, to have him as the focus and the gaze of my life always, to submit to him humbly. Fourth, it takes a faithful pedagogy, faithful teaching, sound doctrine from the scriptures and the orthodox faith. These four things help us to run this race with endurance. These four things God has given us so that we can hold fast to our, our boasting and our confidence. We can be confident in what Christ has done. It's the sure rock of our, our life. So what's our hope? Why is Jesus' family and household so much better than anything else that we can find or create ourselves? Also, even when we drift away at times from the faith, because that, that'll happen. 
right? There would be times when we were tempted to kind of drift away from the faith and from the church. We are held by the strong bands of Christ to come back to him. He always welcomes us back to his family. He brings us back into his family. We come to him in humility and contrition. He cleans us up. He sets a place for us at the family table. There's not a single son or daughter of his who will ever be kicked out of his family, no matter how rebellious they are for a time. No one will ever be kicked out of God's family. We have true community in Christ's family. We have true love and acceptance in his family. We have true purpose and place in his family. And I pray that we as a church would really demonstrate what kind of family we have in Christ, that others might know the surpassing riches of God's love and grace in his son, Jesus Christ, that his family might continue to grow for his glory in the world. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to say thank you for being our father. Thank you for calling us to yourself. Thank you that we can hear your voice, Lord Jesus, and and follow you to life and to a, a new and better, more glorious kingdom that you've rescued us from the penalty of sin and from the power of sin in our life. Jesus, I pray that we, as the Resolve Church, would would be holy brothers and sisters, that we would really live out and approximate the heavenly calling that has been given to us, never to be revoked or removed. And God, I pray that this identity would begin to shape how we live our life, that it would be worked out in real time and changing our thoughts and changing our desires changing the motivations for what we live for and why we live for it. Jesus, we thank you for all these things. We thank you for your word. We pray that we continue to minister to us now as we prepare to respond to you in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand as we prepare to respond. We do this in three ways. Uh, We do this by giving back of our finances to the Lord, saying thank you for your abundant riches that you've provided for us daily. We do this in singing, of course. I encourage you guys to sing uh, loudly. We have wonderful uh, voices leading us in, in song. is beautiful. So let's sing in beauty to the Lord, but also at the Lord's Supper. We have different uh, communion stations kind of throughout the patio here. And this is the family table, right? This is the, the, the table of the family of God. For all who have heard the call of Christ in their lives and have been adopted into the family of God, we all have a place at the table. Here we eat and drink as true brothers and sisters. Here we enjoy the blessing of our Father in the presence of His Spirit. And here we partake of the great ministry of our big brother Jesus that he has begun in our lives. So today, Resolve Church, may we eat in unity, peace, and glory. Take some time to uh, kind of ponder these things and then feel free to take the Lord's Supper when you're ready.